You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the BH Photography Podcast. Today we have a special episode. We are recording live on tape, as they say on TV, uh, and we are at the Depth of Field Professional Portrait Wedding and Event Photography slash Video Conference, which is sponsored by b uh, with several other vendors here, and I'm going to read off their names. We have Adobe, Leica, Panasonic, Pro Photo Sigma, ViewSonic. Uh, other companies who are displaying here are Canon, Godox, Nikon, Sony, and LG. We're going to be speaking to several vendors in no particular order as we can grab them, but at the end of two days, we're going to have a pretty good snapshot of what's happening in the world of wedding and portrait photography, as well as some new developments in terms of technology for uh, screens, lighting, cameras, and lenses. Uh, And that's what this whole show is going to be about, so stay tuned. We are with Lindsay Silverman, who is the Senior Product Manager, Pro DSLRs of Nikon Incorporated USA. Welcome. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. Nice to be back at B&H. We're coming into the time of year where new toys start coming to market. Anything you can tell us no, about? We, we can never reveal what's coming out. You know I can't do that, but well, I can tell I you what... I read some really good rumors. <laughs> well, what's new, though? I mean, yeah, we're, never, we're never talking about rumors. <laughs> we just came out with a lens that is uh, another really hot item. The 180 to 400 AFS 180 to 400 TC14. Oh yeah, it's our yeah. first lens with a built-in teleconverter. Mm-hmm. And the 200 to 400 was an incredibly popular pro wildlife and sports uh, lens. And this is proving itself to outdo the popularity of that lens. That you know, if you it adds a uh, whole new dimension to the lens. Really don't does. underestimate not having to take a lens off and add a teleconverter mm-hmm, when you're out mm-hmm, working absolutely. in the field. And at the Olymp- the Winter Olympics, they, that was a big part of the story. They didn't have to remove the lens, expose the, the mirror box, reach in a bag, grab a converter. With one finger while holding the lens, they can engage the teleconverter and use it. And they said that uh, the performance with converter or without was equal. Almost every photographer we talked to said it was equal. It's lighter. It's a little smaller. They said remarkable. And I know here at B&H, you guys carry that. And even that's hard to get at the moment, which, yeah. is, which is kind yeah, of amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you get for making a good product. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah what happens. The, the 105, 1. 1.4, still a remarkable lens, yeah. still very hot. I just came from uh, NAB show and the WPPI shows mm-hmm. in Las Vegas. And portrait photographers, videographers, they are after that lens. It's such a unique look at such a fast aperture. And um, so people, people are embracing these high-tech high ticket type tools like like I've never seen before. Well, Lindsay Silverman, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Love to have B&H and uh, love everything that you guys do. Okay. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lindsay. We are now being joined by Ken Curry, who is the national sales manager with Ryko Pentax. Appreciate having me. About a year ago, I did a uh, field test on the Pentax K1. And I was really impressed with that camera. It, it's a lot of camera, and I was amazed at what technologies were packed into this thing. And then I looked at the price tag for it, and I think that might be one of the best deals as far as what you're getting, as far as gear, imaging, and everything else in one package. Durability. Durability, too. It's a great camera. Now there's a new version of it. There is, yeah. The, the K1 has now moved to the K1 Mark II. Okay. So it's the same full frame body chassis, magnesium alloy, weather sealed, weather resistant. But what we've done is we've taken and added an accelerator unit to the prime imaging engine. So we get better the overall image quality, lower noise and high ISOs, which is, you know. And it was already very, the, the files were already beautiful. It, it, it's yeah. pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. We also have the pixel shift resolution, which we had in the K1, but now we've taken it a little another step further where instead of having to do pixel shift on top of a tripod, you can actually handhold it. That's pretty sick. It's, it's pretty amazing, <laughs> yeah. So you're gonna capture, it captures four different images and with the, the sensor basically in a different position right. and then compiles all of them to give you a really high resolution image. What's the, the lag time on that or how does that, how's that work when you're operating it? Yeah, after you take the photo, it is gonna compile it so it takes a few seconds. So, you know, depending on the amount of data that's there, you know, it can be, you know, I've seen it as fast as eight to 10 seconds and then it can expand out a and little bit more. And are you gonna more. hear four frames, you're gonna you hear ch- 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 
Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. Very quickly, though. You guys are able to pull this off with a handheld exposures and get away with it? Exactly. that, to me, is pretty amazing. It is. It's a, you know, it's an, obviously a new technology, but the, the fact is, is that our sensor-based shake has given us a lot of features the, over the years. Uh, oh, you know, so it's sort of gimbals. That give, so in other words, if the camera's moving one way, it's compensating a little. Ah, it's exactly okay. correct. Yeah, it, it, our sensor floats on the, you know, basically right. on a magnetic base. So it's not gear driven. So it's free floating design and actually a little bit of rotation as well. Uh, we've been able to take that technology and parlay that not only for the uh, pixel shift resolution, but a feature called Astro Tracer for uh, long time uh, exposures and the Astro Tracer uh, features, you know, just another element of having that sensor-based shake for us. That technology has allowed us to have a lot of extra features built into the camera. And, and you, know, you know, to your point, it, it, it's a better value overall because uh, we're still one of the lowest price point full-frame products that's out there, especially I, I, with I what it's doing. I want to add to that low price point but without sacrificing quality. Yeah. Can you explain easily what the relationship with Ricoh Pentax is and, and how you guys decide which cameras you're going to brand Ricoh and which you're going to brand Pentax? Yeah, so Ricoh is the owner of the Pentax brand, right. effectively. So uh, that happened uh, over three years ago. Mm-hmm. And so the differentiation at that point in time was that Rico was the ownership company. And some of the products we've branded under the Ricoh name, obviously the GR series, which Ricoh, you know, they, they developed and they brought that. Yeah, that, that you, I mean, you have to couple. keep that. You've yes. got to keep that as Ricoh. So we basically made the decision that most of the compact products, like our WG series, would be branded as Ricoh. Interchangeable lens products would, would stay Pentax. And then also our sport optic stays Pentax as well. So more on the optic side of it, it's all Pentax. We have that heritage. Uh, both products are, are, you know, made very, very well. The quality is there. Uh, it's nice that we have a really diverse lineup of products. And then one of the newest things that Rico has brought to the table for us is the Theta, which is our 360 product. We have our, we're on our fifth version now. And uh, for, you know, for us, it's very exciting because each time the technology changes, the quality changes, the, the ability to use it with different apps on your mobile device changes and we continue to improve that. You guys made your name way back when with the Spotmatic and the K1000. You talk about basic photography. The K1000 launched a lot of photography careers Careers. and and, and lifestyles and hobbies. Mm -hmm. Bring it back up. I had one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all did. Okay, now, there's a whole thing. A film is making a comeback right now. Now, I'm not saying go make a film camera, although I won't, a lot of people won't mind if you did, okay? But how about coming out with a digital camera that's rooted in a K1000? Mm-hmm. Strip all the games away from it and everything else. A basic, simple, entry-level DSLR that looks like a K1000. Analog styling. This is just my little thing, but I'm throwing that out there. I love I the strongly idea. Suggest, I strongly suggest this. Ken Curry, thank you so much for joining us today. We are with David Piazza, which is Italian for Town Square. Yeah, that's right. right. I, I just learned. <laughs> okay. And David is the Director of Sales in North America for Westcott uh, Lighting and Light Shaping Tools. And um, the topic around the show today seems to be a lot for continuous light and LED and things of that sort. What are you guys up to these days with lighting? What's your hot products? Well, we've got a few hot products. We, we've been in LED lighting for, oh, man, close to, close to a decade. And our first innovative product we put out was called the Ice Light. And we're on our second version of the Ice Light. It was helped to be invented by Jerry Johannes, who was one of the biggest portrait and wedding photographers in the world. Who's here. And it's, a, it's like a, a lightsaber. Yeah. Um, uh, very much like you see on Star Wars, except it's LED, dimmable, daylight balanced, battery operated. And it doesn't have a Graflex handle. It does not have a Graflex <laughs> handle. You just showed how old you are. Oh. Right? Us old guys, we know a Graflex is. That's right. Anybody who's born uh, like my kids and they're, they're 25, 26, they, yeah. they don't know what that I'm means. I'm 32, so I'm old enough, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, you look a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and with the ice. <laughs> and act a lot younger. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, our next new, new innovation is called the Flex. And that is also oh, a LED great. panel. Yeah. It's a flat panel, but it's flexible. Mm-hmm. So it's about, oh, maybe a quarter of an inch thick, one by one foot, one by two foot, one by three, two by two, completely flexible. So you can make it into a 360, like a China ball. 
or you can make it very narrow. You can shape it to a wall, to a pillar. You can tape it or clamp it to a suspended ceiling. And these are very powerful lights, again, daylight and bicolor, um, that you can adjust the, uh, the intensity steplessly. The two by two foot is four times as powerful as the one by one. We do it by like the square foot. I, by the way, I know somebody who was doing a photo, was shooting video in a car interior, and they used those, they lined the, uh, well, they basically, anything was out of frame, they just molded your, these that lights into exactly it. That is exactly how the, uh, the Flex is designed mm -hmm. to be used. There's now, no, they, room, no room for lighting, but there's light. Yeah. Exactly. How do you get them up? I mean, are they adhesive, self-adhesive? They work well, on Velcro? They have Velcro, Velcro okay. along the whole edge of it on both sides. Okay. So we have a, a frame called Scrim Gem that you can Velcro it to with a diffusion panel that Velcros to the front. The Velcro itself can stick to any other Velcro. So uh, when you make it into a China ball, when you, you make it into a circle, it Velcros to each other. Right. When you want to travel with it, you can roll it up. And that's how you can transport it to take less space. Now, the one by one, I typically don't roll to, trans to transport, but a one by two, one by three, two by two, one by three and two, one by two in particular, I can roll that up into a 12 inches by maybe two or three inch diameter and it's safe. And I can just bring the power source and the dimmer separately. So I can put two or three lights in a carry-on bag onto an airline. And these right? are battery powered? Huge. Battery you charged. can do battery power in the one by one. We're working on battery power for the bigger sizes. Mm -hmm. We're working on a lot of things with the Flex. We're gonna be um, um, having a lot more innovations later this year. And can you, pan can you attach them to a panel and put them on a stand also? Or yes. is that a whole separate product? The, the frame that we have that's mm -hmm. available has a 3 8 inch tap on it. And then we sell a kit that's got a mount on it, a double mm -hmm. ball mount. And then you can put that on any light stand or grip equipment. It's very easy to grip. You can clamp the frame, you can just clamp the mat itself. So on TV sets and feature films, they do a lot of clamping, taping, mm -hmm. Velcro, anything. Any because it, does, it hardly weighs anything. Right. And it is water resistant too, which yes. is awesome for yeah, out yeah, on location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, just to be clear, it's not designed to be submerged. So it's, it's an like excellent splash, light. but don't go diving with it. Don't go diving with yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Nothing in the bathtub, nothing yeah. weird, you know? <laughs> and then our, our latest light is called the Solix. So we, we have a lot of different um, lights for different uh, photographers and videographers. I feel, our company feels that there are a lot of tools available to us as photographers and videographers. We all have different ways to work, just like a carpenter or an electrician or a painter. When you're a painter, you don't use a very small brush to do paint a wall. You use a large brush or a roller. When you have to paint trim, you use a smaller brush. So we have all these different tools and ways to accomplish it. The Solix is a little bit different in one respect. It's made for videographers, but it's also giving a very big nod to photographers. It's a round light, uh, LED of course, daylight balanced, dimmable, but it also has a ring built into it that you can put standard soft boxes on it. Now, when you have a light panel, any light panel, even our, our flexes, it's difficult to put it into a standard light modifier. It will hold anything from a 12 by 36 strip bank up to a seven foot octobank. Any manufacturer also. So that's a great piece and it's um, uh, uh, very priced very attractively. For $449, you get the uh, barn doors that attaches with a magnet, uh, uh, also a diffusion dome that goes on with a magnet, take it off, put it on, same thing with the barn doors, and it comes with a full carry case with a strap and all that for $449. It's a great uh, price pointed piece. So uh, going forward, we're always, Westcott's very known, known for our innovative products. We also have a lot of light modifiers. A light modifier is anything that you use to change the quality of light. Reflectors, soft boxes, um, diffusion panels, things like that. Our most innovative product is called the eye lighter. And the eye lighter is a, a, a curved reflector that is designed to go underneath someone's face when you're doing a portrait. And it does a couple things for you. It, it pushes up light from underneath and really fills in around the face. They use this on broadcasts a lot, don't they? On, on uh, 
I know we're talking heads on TV. I've noticed. Uh, talking that. heads, they, you, you, you do see very extensive reflection. Ridiculous. They may, uh, yeah. they're, they're really shaping light quite a bit when you're doing broadcast. Uh, if you've ever gone onto a TV set or a feature film set, it is astounding what these guys can do with scrims and reflectors and lights. And those are the kind of products that we make. And, and these are the kind of innovation that we can bring to the general public, especially for a portrait photographer that may not be that experienced with us. The eye lighter is kind of a no-brainer. You put this thing down, you shine a light onto it, you put it underneath a, a, a subject's face, and all of a sudden they look beautiful. I can even make you look good. That's got to be. Bet. That's. That I don't know. That has to be a good product. Yeah. There's, no, there's no product. Yeah, that. I know. I have shatterproof mirrors in my house, so I, I mean, it's a challenge. I get it. Uh, and then uh, Westcott also makes a whole series of, um, of what we call rapid boxes, and the rapid boxes we make for both speed lights and for studio strobes, and they're very quick to set up, very easy to set up. We can put deflector plates in all of them to give you a beauty dish type of look. So we make them for uh, studio strobes. Uh, one by one by three, 48 inch octa, 36 inch octa. We're coming out with different sizes very soon. For speed lights, we have a 26 inch octa, a 10 by 24 strip, a 32 inch uh, duo that is designed to take two speed lights. These things are just great tools that I never had when I was younger that make um, light modification easy, can pick up the quality of what you're trying to accomplish, get you to the spot you need to get to quicker and easier. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. All right. We are with LeVon Hall of Adobe. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I, I was over at your booth earlier and you're walking some people through Photoshop and Lightroom. And what else are you doing here? And what's new from Adobe? Okay. So basically, I get a lot of questions um, regarding... Uh, the creative cloud mm -hmm. and people going into the cloud. There's still people out there that are afraid of the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's mainly because they're not sure what the cloud does. So they're thinking, oh, if I sign up for a creative cloud, that means everything is in the cloud. And if I want to use the computer, you know, use Lightroom and not be connected to the internet. And like, no, that's not what that means. Right. Um, and they're like, oh, so I can actually use it without being connected to the internet. I'm like, yes. And they also think all their images are in the cloud and they can't use them on. I mean, it's just, just weird. Just tell them that the cloud takes 1099 out of the credit card every <laughs> yes. month and you're good to go. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to explain to them. Um, but I think I've gotten um, some of the people that have attended here a better understanding of what the cloud does and that they can use it without being connected to the, the internet. Um, and also that eventually, whatever version they're on before the cloud, it's going to disappear eventually. So they're gonna have to make that jump. So some people did, I heard, make the jump today. Oh, yeah. So that's oh, good that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but in terms of new features, there's a few new features that came out uh, recently, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know if any of you know about the dehaze filter? Have I've you? heard it and I have not had a chance to play around with it. Okay, the dehaze filter is actually a really cool filter. So if you think of, I love to use an example when I'm showing this filter, um, when you're in an airplane. Lots of people take photos from their seat in yeah. the airplane. Yeah, that's a good point. And if you notice, it's like, wow, it's kind of hazy and you can't really see anything. Actually, if you shoot midday in that July too. and August, it, it's, it goes that awful, yes. harsh blue. Well, we have this filter called dehaze, and the main thing that they actually did with the filter is it was all the way at the bottom of the tools, so no one really knew about it unless someone showed you and like, oh, go all the way down, use the dehaze, and they're like, oh wow, that's amazing. Is that a fancy name for 81A filter, or is it more than an 81A warming filter? It's more than that. Okay. It's definitely more than that. Because that used to be a default way of doing that. Um, when it's, shooting film, you just drop that filter on, it killed a lot of it. it what it does is it brings up like more of the contrast. Um, so if you're bringing it more towards it's like using more of the dehaze filter, the image gets this. It's similar to clarity, but it gives it a different kind of pop. So if you've ever used clarity, okay. clarity is working more with the midtone. So it's giving your midtone that, that extra what, pop. Yeah, I never figured out. I, I look at it. It's making difference. I can never figure out what it's doing, though. I just <gasps> know when it looks good. Okay. Yeah. It's basically working with your midtones. Okay. All right. I... I 
Never so knew so yeah. being a new feature, well, not, it's not a new feature. You it's just, not a you new just feature. Relocated they it? just relocated. So now it's under clarity. So it's in the basic panel that when you, it's like the first tools that you're going to work with, and it's so there. Given that, you know, if you're a cloud member, if you're, you know, you're getting it from the cloud, then just when they've put it into the system or into the, in the program, the next time you open it up, it's there? No, you have to update. Have so to they update. tell you there's an update. Um, and then they also tell you what's new in the update. Mm-hmm. So if you think it's something that's useful, um, you update. Um, that's one that they moved the dehaze filter, but they also moved, I don't know if you've used the um, camera profiles, which was also all the way at the bottom. Um, and that's another feature that you would use first when you open up your image. So the camera profile is similar to if you shot a JPEG on your camera. It's like, oh, it looks beautiful. But when you do the um, raw, it's like, oh, how come it doesn't have, you know, those beautiful vivid colors like it did when it was on the back of the LCD? Well, the camera profile you can use. um, I know Nikon has some uh, Canon that are built into Lightroom. So if you're using a Canon camera, then if you bring in an image, you're going to have the Canon. It'll automatically recognize that that's yes. okay. It'll have the cam- Canon or the Nikon uh, camera profile. Sony p- cameras covered there yet? In you order? know, I haven't seen the Sony. I know, I think they're working on other camera manufacturers. Okay. Um, but if they don't, you can actually create your own. Mm-hmm. So you can use, um, Adobe has a standard one for all the other camera manufacturers. So you can start with that and then create your own. But you don't even have to do that because there's a new feature. <laughs> so the <laughs> profiles, those came up to the top as well. Um, but what they did with the profiles, they added extra presets for the profile. So the standard was like neutral, um, landscapes, portraits. So now they have some for black and white where you can use one for using a green filter or using the red filter. And then they have, I think, some artistic presets. So you can start with those filters first, or I should say those profiles. And then once you do that, it's like you're getting a starting point for your images. Then you start working with like exposure, highlights, and shadows, and then you can perfect that image. So that's kind of like your starting point. Yvonne, representing Adobe, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Bye. Bye. We are with Jason Mantell, who is with Sony Imaging Pro Support. Uh, he's one of the team members. He is the Northeast rep. So if you're in the Northeast of the U.S. and you need ProTech support, Jay's the guy. Anyway, welcome. welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, um, Sony's been making some waves lately. You're, uh, the A9 is a success. The A7R3 is. And the A7 S7 III. And, and, and the A7 III. All the threes. All the threes. Yeah, all we're the in the threes. threes now. Yeah. This is, uh, um, uh, and, and you're talking to two out of three of us here are our Sony A7 series uh, aficionados. I bought the first one. And I've owned, I think I'm on my third or fourth one already. And I love the cameras. They're really, really, really good. Where are we going from here with Sony? What, what's the roadmap look like? Because you guys have, you, you got the megapixels, now you have the speed, and you got the video, you got the size, uh, your batteries aren't frying anything and dying. Everything, everything seems to be going much better right now. We're, we're, what's the next move? Yeah, we're like, right now we're in the sweet spot. You know, mm-hmm. like, you know, we had cameras that did great things, but they couldn't do everything previously, right. and now we're right there. Like, every current camera that's come out in the last six to eight months can literally do everything. You, it can be your only camera. It, it happens to be small and portable, whereas previously, like that was like you got it because it was small and portable, but it there were certain things it couldn't do. So you still had to have a second body or something. And now it can be your only body. Like the A9 is an absolute monster. It can replace anything in your bag and do pretty much everything. You need the resolution of the 7R3, and it's just an unbelievable image quality and the speed, as you mentioned. Um, so now, and then they all do great video, like unbelievable video features, all on full frame sensors. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's mm-hmm. really insane kind of how much power these cameras have now. Um, obviously, I can't speak to future products, but... Um, no, it's just between us. You can, uh, oh, that's... Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah, this yeah, thing yeah. in front this of me, just, just, yeah, just, just here for show. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, yeah the... Um, T- tell us everything. Obviously, you know, we have some uh, lenses in the works. We've announced the, the 400 will be coming because um, we need some really pro glass. Mm-hmm. So we have a 400 to that's that's, you know, in development now that should, should be out, um, I think they said summer, I believe is, it was the timeline. Um, so that's going to be a phenomenal kind of addition. And obviously, so, I mean, we're excited kind of that the, the, the mirror, you know, people call them mirrorless as if it's like a, a bad thing, but kind of, I, I like to shy away from that. Really? It's just a camera. I, I've never heard that. <laughs> I don't, I, no, seriously. I mean, 
Do you well, really I, get I, that? I, think, I mean, do you get I that kind of feedback? Had, I mean, people? They, they're like there's DSLRs and there's mirrorless. Like yeah. People kind of view them as separate because back in the day there were those trade-offs. There were issues yeah. about mirrorless. The focusing was not as good. Yeah. There were issues with some of the viewing screens and things, but. Well, there's issues with DSLR too. I mean, yeah, but things, I, I think those have all been nullified. I think it's a very clear playing field well, right now. Well, let me now. ask about the, the idea that you guys, if I'm not mistaken, the, the original A7 is still for sale, right? I mean, you can still buy that at P&H, no? Yes. And yeah. So all three are still, all nine are still available, and then you have the A9. What do, uh, what do the first generation of buyers say to you when, when they, they look a year later and see... The, the next iteration out, and they just spent four thousand dollars. Yeah, and that's the same at, at any company I've ever worked for, and, and anything you know, it's always you always get that guy who's like, "Oh, I just bought, every time I buy a camera, a new one comes out a week later, and then <laughs> you do this to me every time." It's like, yeah, we do it specifically to you. To you. We, we wait for you to <laughs> yeah. buy your camera. I mean, you know, these technologies I turn over. I knew they did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we watch. The tape is running, right? You're that guy that we keeps got you uh, sending those emails, right? <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, the the industry, I mean, all technology industries. Yeah. They turn over so fast because sure. technologies are growing and changing so quickly. Yeah, but usually when a new model comes out, the old one vanishes fairly quickly. There might be a little bit of overlap from stock, but it's not just the A7 series. You, the RX100, which came yeah. out, what, yeah. six years ago? Yeah, yeah. Sony's... Up to Series 5 now, and you can still buy the original. You can buy all of them. <laughs> I yeah, guess Sony's you can say that's because they're so good, right? It's I mean, price point, yeah. and they're all good cameras. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Sony's had a history of kind of doing that. They, they keep things in the line because, to your point, right? I mean, sure, dealers have stock, but you, know, you could blow that up. Companies do that. But um, you know, they're still great cameras. So yeah, it sets a price point. Um, you know, it's very important that the retail staff like B&H is great at that. They're, they're educated so they can help inform people that this camera is great for that price, but here's what you're missing out on because things have changed in the last six years in some cases. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all still current, which for some people is a great thing. For some people, it, maybe it's confusing or something, but that's why education is such an important yeah. part of it. And is pro support, is that a new, I'm sorry if I don't know this, but no, it's, is it, uh, and, you know, all Canon professional services, all the, the companies and have. Nikon their, too. And I, I was going to the same thing. Are yeah. you guys, are you there for pro photographers as those branches of their companies are? Or is this more about education to the general public? No, so like specifically, that, that is what okay. we are. The pro support group, we're at every major sporting event right now. Right. We were at the... We were at the Olympics. We were at the Super Bowl. We were at the U.S. Open of golf and tennis. Like mm -hmm. we we're there in a in a pro support suite, loaning, repairing gear. Okay. Um, and to qualify to become a member, so you're a, a you have to be a Sony product yeah. owner. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about what about other qualifications? I mean, um, you know, somebody goes out and they buy themselves an A9 or, or an A7 III or whatever, and they say, "Hey, I want to join." Uh, yeah, so, what are the requirements? So if, uh, if you've never seen it, there's a Sony Alpha Universe is our like web page, mm -hmm. right, our okay. universe mm -hmm. devoted to all things Alpha. So on that page is a pro support link. Um, and through that, you can register. Um, basically, anyone can register, but to be an actual pro support member, like CPS or MPS kind of member, um, you need to have two full frame cameras and uh, three higher end lenses, G lenses, Zeiss lenses, G master lenses, anything like that. Fair enough. Um, and then that would qualify. And you have to be a working professional. Like you have to be have taking to have pictures okay. for them. You have a catalog portfolio website. Um, and Which is just, essentially pretty much the requirements of any of the other major manufacturers who offer parallel programs. It's like you have to qualify. Yeah, it's very, so it, you have to be published. You have to own the gear and you got to be working. working. Yeah. 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 But then it comes with perks like uh, expedited repair, loaners while your gear's in repair, discounts on repair, mm -hmm. um, access to me, which is, to me is the biggest perk of, course, of all. That, absolutely, you know. yeah. Um, but, you know, and we're out here supporting pros in the field. I, I work with many major agencies and newspapers. Um, same thing, loaning them gear, letting them try cool new stuff as it comes out, um, supporting them if theirs has issues, all, all that. Is and what, kind you, of what kind of feedback do you get from these shooters in terms of uh, what they'd like to see in the next... A camera, and that one, camera. One of the coolest things actually with Sony recently is, is their eagerness to listen to photographers and, and actually take their uh, feedback and, and, and suggestions. So, for instance, we've come out with already you know, a, a firmware update that specifically added things that people were asking for that are pros. They, they needed um, uh, certain tagging and, and things, features in the camera to be added, and that was added via firmware, whereas other companies tend to make you wait for the next model. Um, so Sony's very active in, in getting that feedback and then utilizing that feedback. Um, so, you know, there's everything so far that we've been getting is, is something that we're trying to address in firmware rather than having to make a new camera. And fair to say, though, that uh, lenses are still the one thing that uh, a lot of people are asking for from, from Sony or... Or, yeah, you know, that was always one of the things you, if you ask people, they'd be like, oh, Sony doesn't have enough lenses. And now I'd say... 2018, like now, at, at this point today, mm -hmm. we're kind of past that. We have almost 
every major lens that somebody needs. So we have this full suite of F4 lenses, 1635, 24, 70, 70, 200. Mm -hmm. Same thing at F2.8 two eight with our yeah. G Masters, which are absolutely dynamite lenses. If you've, they're crazy sharp. Um, we have super wide. We have a ton of primes. And now... Uh, nice um, relationship. Yeah and, yeah. and now the universe has kind of expanded with the third-party stuff. You know, Tamron announced some new lenses. Sigma's announced some new lenses, mm -hmm. which to me is all a great thing. Like, it, as much as this... I know a lot of manufacturers coming out with new lenses only in email. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah which yeah. is the, terrific. The, the, the Voigtlander. The, uh, the Firin group from Tamron uh -huh. to Tamron or... Tokina. Uh, Tokina. Tokina. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get to this other question, which I'm sure you get all the time, is... Uh, with all the attention on the E mount and, and the E cameras, what about the A line? Uh, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's very much still a thing. I mean, the A ninety nine Mark II is a phenomenal camera. Mm -hmm. um, it, obviously, I, it doesn't do you have, have one over here. Uh, we do not. <laughs> okay. No, we have we have all of our gear here, of course. <laughs> um, and that's they're good. all still on display at B and H. If you'd like to, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, obviously, yeah. that's not currently where the wow factor is everybody yeah. wants to see the latest and greatest mm -hmm. and as of right now the the current a mount line hasn't been updated in, in a little bit but um it's still very much a thing a lot of people use it and love mm -hmm. it and you can use all the a mount lenses on the e mount cameras um with full functionality with the adapter with, with the right adapters mm -hmm. so it's 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 still very much a thing but obviously the main focus right now is on the e because that's the thing that, that makes ours so different you know right. a mount has some advantages over competition but it's still kind of the same concept whereas well, I must think, i mean in, I guess in the general population, the E-mount, I see them on the streets all the time, and it, clearly they're, you know, they're the most talked about camera out there. But in the professional world, I, you probably see a lot more A-mounts. You see a lot of people work in the A-mount at golf events or at tennis events just because of the speed of the, the DSLR and I mean, previously, the long lenses. And yes, yeah. but as of last year, that's where I started to notice this shift. So, like, you know, we were at a show last month called Shutterfest. And we saw a ton of people with, with A-mount cameras, but I'd say it was 50-50 with working pros now. Because, you know, like I said, they, they might have used an A7R2 in studio, but that probably wasn't the best camera for them to use in a wedding-type setting in low light and stuff. It wasn't made for that. Whereas now, any of the A7s, the Mark III's or the A9, are phenomenal for and that. And then you also have the frames per second factor yeah. going for yeah. you right now. That yeah. used to be an issue. Your focusing is, 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 is there now. Absolutely. Okay? That used to be questionable, and it took a lot of technology the little leaps to be able to get there. You have frames per second. You got all this stuff. So I, I don't see how DSLRs, it, it's harder for me to defend them. And especially when I pick one up, when you've used you know, those cameras for a while and you pick up a DSLR, and yeah, they're <laughs> wonderful. Any of the flagship DSLRs are terrific. But I find it, I, I pick them up and I go, why is this camera so big? Yeah. <laughs> That's and what to, gets me To right some now. people, it's literally just... There are some people that are unwilling to give up that form factor. And that, I'll also say I happen to know somebody who is still swearing by uh, his full-blown DSLR because he likes the way it fills his hands. And the are always going to have that. Yeah, exactly. There's always that person who's like, oh, it's different. I can't use it because it's different. How many of the pro shooters uh, put a grip on it on the A7 series? To it's, shoot it? it's funny you say that. So I deal with, obviously, these pros every day. And, and almost every one of them says, oh, I love the camera, but I need a grip. Which is funny because you're, you, you're looking at this camera because it's smaller, and then the first thing you do is try to make it bigger. So pretty much everyone I deal with, um, I talk them out of the double battery grip because that's kind of an old school of thought. Like, you don't need two batteries anymore because with the new Z battery, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. So, so cool. So get that out of your head. You don't need two batteries. So then do you need this big grip underneath? No. So we make this awesome little pinky grip. Yeah. So I always I say, try this. And they go, oh, that's perfect. That, that's all I need. And then truth be told probably nine, eight, nine times out of 10, within a couple of weeks of them using it, they're like, you know what? I, I stopped using that pinky grip. I, I didn't need it. It's just kind of, you need that transition <laughs> to get themselves your off of it. hand yeah, used sure. to it. Yeah, oh, I get that. Yeah. And that was myself like a, included. <laughs> Originally, I couldn't use it's it like without a, that. It's like a halfway house. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, baby you know, steps. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Baby steps to the office. Yeah. That's cool, cool. Um, anything else you want to throw at us? I mean, in terms of even uh, down the, I guess down the line in terms of, well, you talked about the RX series a bit. Uh, anything? I mean, the, the newest, hottest, everyone is talking about the A7 Mark III. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, it's called a, quote, basic model. But right. you look at the specs, and this thing is absolute it's all you need. killer. Yeah. Image quality is great. megapixel is more than enough. For mo anything. I mean, I can't for speak for every I, photographer. Even, yes. Sure, some people need the resolution. They're making large prints or, or huge crops. Like, I get that. But, yeah, this, the 7 III, you know, we're using it here in our studio, and you, you mix that with essentially the A9 type focusing system, mm -hmm. 693 points with the eye autofocus, so it tracks the eye anywhere in the frame. 
it's changed the way wedding and portrait shooters work specifically because now you can worry about your composition. Like the camera's gonna focus on the eye. I don't have to move the focus point to just the right spot because if I work wide open, I end up with a nose in focus instead of an eye and the shot's ruined. You don't have to deal with that anymore. The camera does it and you can customize the camera. It's also another favorite of mine when I deal with these pros is because they're coming from another camera manufacturer. So they're like, oh, my button used to do this. Well, that's no problem. Like the Sony, I can customize pretty much every button and wheel and dial yeah, yeah, to yeah. do what you want. You can even change the direction they spin to match what you're used to. Because that people, I think, is the biggest hurdle to overcome is like the it's different. And like, I, I want to use it, but I'm scared. Like they, Because these people, they have muscle memory. They've been using the same camera for 30 years. Um, so I sit down with them and say, you know, it's okay. The first step is like, it's like therapy. You're like, it's okay. It's okay to be scared. <laughs> and then an hour later, they're like, oh, this isn't yeah, a big deal. Cause it's a camera, you know, like yeah. shutter speeds and stops. Day, it's, mm -hmm. And if you were to, if someone came to you and said, I'm not sure to buy the a7 III or the a9, what would you tell them? Yeah. So it, again, it's all about finding the right tool for the right person. And now we have a full line of them. So um, yeah, resolu if you need resolution, that's what the R, right? R for resolution. A7R3, can't beat it. Awesome. Um, if your main goal is to use it for silent mode, the A9 is is the one. I mean, it has having the stacked sensor gives it unbelievable capabilities in silent mode. And even though other manufacturers say their cameras have a quiet or silent mode, um, you know, you lose tracking autofocus, you lose exposure. Like, there's crazy things. Whereas ours, whether it's in silent or mechanical, um, you lose no frames per second, no auto, everything works exactly the same. So the A9 is incredible for the higher end sports shooter or someone who specifically needs silent. I work with a lot of guys from Lincoln Center, guys mm -hmm. and gals, um, um, who do like Broadway type mm -hmm. shooting and mm -hmm. to not have to put the camera in a blimp is like life changing yeah. for them. Yeah. Jason Mantel of Sony, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you guys. Okay. All right. Okay, we are with Mark Fob of Sigma. Good morning. Hi there. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. I, went, I recently uh, did a field test of the 14 millimeter art lens. Okay. Uh, I want you to know great lens, but I hurt myself lifting it. I, I okay. swear. It's, <laughs> that thing's big. Okay. But it's beautiful. I mean, the pictures that they are just absolutely gorgeous. Really oh, they, they, they are. Uh, actually, what's funny is that with, with lenses like that, that have all that correction in there, first thing people, when they walk up and look at it, oh, is that a fisheye? No. Uh -huh. I actually pull out the 15 millimeter and sit it down next to them, give them a lesson on what a fisheye looks like versus, you know, the mm -hmm. corrected optic. Mm -hmm. You know, the bubbles on the inside versus the bubble on the outside, which is correcting or you're parallaxing. But yeah, as, as far as uh, an incredible optic, uh, the 14, I mean, incredibly straight, no distortion. Yeah. To be, to be yeah, able yeah. to look at a straight pillar mm -hmm. to do something architecturally and... Um, it's incredible. I mean, I've, I've dropped it onto actually a couple of DSLRs and even like a Black Magic and done some oh, yeah. video with it. Oh, dear God, it's yeah. gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the close focus on it, I, the first thing I, I do is I'll have someone pick it up and take a look at a ceiling that has some kind of grid or light system in there to see how perfectly straight it is. And then I'll say, okay, go turn around and take a picture of me. So if you want to do environmental, and then I'll put my finger about four inches off the front element and they're like, oh, wow. Like, yeah. This is a lens that you have to have in your bag. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's absolutely stunning. The whole, it's really been, you know, the whole um, uh, Art Lens series has just been real, real good. I've used, I don't know, maybe five of them already, and they're lovely. You guys are just hitting it real good. Whatever, whatever's in the secret changed, sauce. I mean, I don't want it to change the industry, but it, it's changed third-party manufacturing of lenses. And that it, is, it has. I mean, it's changed everything. I mean, yeah, like everyone's the term following of, suit, and... I guess the two other companies that we're not going to talk about, uh, Canon and Nikon. You no longer <laughs> have to sneeze when you mention the name of the have manufacturer. Their oh, yeah, it's my new. On what signals <laughs> doing? I mean, or tried to improve them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I'll even take it to a different level. When you get dirty looks from one of the guys from the other side of the pond, you yeah. know, over, over in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. They're not real happy yeah. with it either because yeah, 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 it's yeah. like, huh. exactly. It's a good you point. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's whatever they put in the secret sauce. It's mm -hmm. it's good, mm -hmm. and they gotta keep doing it because it's. Um, with all of the releases, there's not a dog in the bunch. No. Even, even when you go down into the, into the contemporary series, um, just because it's a entry level type lens with a variable aperture, the optics are are, are wicked, wicked sharp. I mean, the 18 to 300 is a great example. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. been a fan of an all-in-one lens because, you know, it's hard to do everything well. But I put that lens on on to a 7D Mark II the first time it came out, and 7,000 frames later, I was changing the lens. I shot three days consecutively out in the Nevada desert. I did. It was an off-road event, and 
the images are just mind bending. It's it's and people look at it like, wow. I, I was shooting for the owner of Race, and when I turned around and handed him this body of work, and I'm like, you're not going to believe this. This was this was shot off of a consumer product. And, you know, he's he's seen me roll in with the bags and all the good stuff and. And he loves what he sees because this guy is, is nothing but about top shelf And what's equipment. the variable? What's the max aperture at, at 300? 6.3. 6.3, okay. But it's, uh, to be able to, to, to zoom out 80, 90 yards and, and pick up a trophy truck, mm -hmm. you know, clearing a, a, a sand dune and have all the dust, the dirt, and look at the spark plugs under the hood, it's Chris. incredible. So now that you've got pretty much all of the focal lanes covered, where is Sigma going right now? What kind of, do you have any, uh, any idea of like the next? The 105. Was not expecting to see a 105, 14 come out. I mean, it, I've only seen the piece for about five minutes, but the few images that I saw come off it were like mind bending. I want to see what that does. I really, really do. I, I, I'm, I'm really curious about minimum focus on that. How, how it's, tight does it get? It, do you know offhand? It's close. I mean, we were shooting less than three feet from. Okay, so that's the front fun. element. wide open, that's fun. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. 105 millimeter front element. So it, it's got the same front element as that 150 to 600 or 120 to 300 in a lens that's probably about six inches, seven inches long, weighs about three pounds. So it's, it's, got sha a, it's shaped like a cone. <laughs> it's, it, it, honestly, when I saw it the first time, it reminded me very much like the old Nikon F2, the 200 F2. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so it was, it's, it's just short, stubby, and it, it's a brute. It's got its own little tripod collar on there, and it's like, wow, this thing, this thing is is incredible. Um, like I said, I wish I had more time to play with it, but unfortunately, no. Um, and it's on its way to the one and only piece that I know in existence is on its way to Europe right now for another show. Really? Just yeah. <laughs> when when do they expect to release this? Do you have any idea? We don't. They we haven't. Don't. We're hoping somewhere before the end of May. We're we're hoping. Okay. Um, well, May is <laughs> it's pretty close. It's not. Bad. It, it okay. could be three four weeks, but we also don't even have map pricing on it yet, oh, okay. so we're not sure. Um, again, Chris and I get asked probably three or four times a day is what's the price and when's it available. Same as the new uh, e-mounts, which again, you, you know, you were asking me yesterday about what's new and exciting. The fact that we have a whole line of primes coming up with uh, direct FE mount and it's, you know, the lens, the current lens is with the MC11 molded already into the lens. Um, but the fact that you can also do a lens conversion mm -hmm. and take your current Canon and Nikon pieces and turn them into a direct FE mount, which the guys at Sony are doing a happy dance because that means more, you know, A9s and A7Ies are going out the door. It would seem to me that uh, the next place to go would be to be ultra telephoto primes, no? And, and make those kind of, uh, the, what you see on the sidelines. I mean, I know Sigma has those. We had well, those. We, had, we, we still do. We right. still have some really long lenses in the lineup, and they're very good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last year we introduced the 500 F4. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to see a couple of different things. I would love to see that 300 to 800 to get a, um, a sport mm -hmm. makeover. Is that the, no, which is the, the big green? That's the 200 to 500. Is that still, is that oh, just no, no, trotted it, out for shows now? No, or no, is that I mean, it, it's yeah. out there. Yeah. We, we sell a handful a year, and it's okay. usually military or some kind of uh, police department that's that's buying that. Well, also, I, I understand, I, I know one uh, uh, filmmaker, on kind a of budget, they actually use it as a spaceship, I think, it, or... or Yes. <laughs> oh, Captain Nemo so Actually, that was where I was going with the next. <laughs> and next sorry. is that the independent videographers or cinematographers, um, because you throw that onto a, a Super 35 format, you now have a 750 millimeter f2.8 lens. Um, oh, for cinema, yeah, sure. Yeah. So when, you, when you're doing subject matter, again, that you can't physically be on top of, but yet you want that proper depth of field and you want the wherewithal to, again, get in tight, now you have it. Um, and it's, to be honest, the cost of that lens versus like an ingenue, you're right in the ballpark. I mean, think about it. A lot of your cine lenses run 20, 30,000 plus. Easy. It's a $24,000 lens. It's a bargain. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's cool to see what's, what we're doing with, with the products and, and the different directions that we're going with it. And um, it's interesting. Every day is a new adventure to, to wait and see what's coming next. Uh, we've got the new 70 macro, which is a reintroduction of one of the sharpest macro lenses in the world. Um, downside is that it's only available for Canon, Sigma, and will be for Sony out of the gate. The Nikon version of it, um, and here's here's 
Really? The odd part is the focus system is it's a focus by wire. So uh, now, of course, with, with the Nikon mount going to a, um, a magnetic aperture control, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're kind of fighting the tide on that one. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Mark Farb, Signal Lenses. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, Mark. We're going to take a short break right now. We're going to come back with more from Depth of Field. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Okay, we are back again. Uh, we are at Depth of Field and with Casey Krugman of Luxly, which is an interesting uh, LED lighting device. Uh, uh, picture a rear view mirror in your car that could put out, uh, how much white light does this thing put out now? It's rated at 1200 lux at one meter. And it's, that is from three to 10,000 Kelvin. It's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's not only about uh, light and being bright and very, very small. The whole design is really fascinating and the interface is terrific on this. Uh, I've been playing with it here for about 10 or 15 minutes and just real fast on the back, you've got a minimal amount of switches. But what I really like about it is the fact that not only can you go from, uh, uh, was it 5600 uh, daylight? Yeah. To, and 34 and flip back and forth. But you can go infinitely down by dialing it. But not only are you watching your Kelvin going by, but it shows you the icons that you'd see in the back of your camera for cloudy, overcast, shad, you know, things that we relate to. As you can see, the K, the Kelvin, and the icon, and dial it in. I'm going to let you talk the rest of the way here because it's a great product. So, well, that was one of in. the yeah, that was one of the things when it came to the user interface. We worked very hard to make sure that it was as intuitive as possible, and also that you didn't need to specifically speak English to be able to use it. We wanted to make sure that it was very mm. universal. Yeah, yeah. And it's so, literal. of course, it is. the icons are all standard mm -hmm. for the white balance settings and for the the white presets, so why not use them? Yeah, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So we did the same thing when it came to the RGB mode. We actually do a spectrum up top, so you're able to see exactly the range of the color. We also give a degree, uh, which is based on the 360 color wheel. Mm -hmm. And then it also gives you a, a around the 360 color wheel number that is displayed, it actually gives you a little bit of a preview of what the color will look like. And then also, when you get into RGB mode, you're able to control saturation on the unit as well. You can go from 100% all the way down to 20%, and it'll reduce the actual saturation of the colored light that's coming out. So I'm you, astonished the range of color you get. I mean, you, yeah. You're getting from very, very precise color balances to just pure process colors just by flipping buttons and switches here. Uh, it, it, the range is pretty intense. It's pretty incredible, yeah, and it's easy to use, yeah. And the battery comes with it, I'm assuming? Or yeah, it comes separate? with a Sony L-Series style battery, mm -hmm. um, 750, which uh, will give you about an hour to an hour and a half when it comes to full blast. Mm -hmm. And then it comes with a charger and basic shoe mount ball head. So okay. you're ready to shoot as soon as you get out. Right. Now right. you could also sh you, uh, uh, operate this remotely with an app, is that correct? Correct. It has Bluetooth built into it, and uh -huh. we just released our Android version of the app, and we've had our iOS version. Both of them have been updated recently so that they can and use the new built-in filter mode, the digital gel filter mode that we have in these cello units. You have 150 filters to play with. They can be, and they go from technical to the more creative filters as well. Um, so you start off, you have a chroma key green and a chroma key, chroma key blue uh, preset. So you can just throw that, throw that up against a white wall and you'll be able to use that instantaneously as a nice little backdrop or just help out any green screen that you actually bring with you. And, uh, then, we, brilliant. and then we go into the technical. So you have your plus green down to minus green and we go down to an eighth in each of them. So you'll have plus, three quarter, half, whatever. And then we also do the same thing from double CTV to double CTO. So you'll be able to use all of those in order. And um, I didn't realize you had that. That is phenomenal. And and then dialing we, in CTOs, that's great. Yeah, and then you also have a bunch of creative filters so you can have your presets and be able to do everything you want to do. The nice thing is that it's not just an RGB mode where we're just recreating it using the RGB. You can see, and on the website you'll be able to see this, the white balance is still listed in the filter mode. You're able to change the base white balance of the filter and on the unit itself, it will recalculate what the light is output as if you were just draping a gel filter over the front of it. So you're really able to get 
incredible accuracy and treat it as if you had a tungsten or another LED light matching the color temperature that's being put out and then just draping a gel filter over the front of it. Who are you seeing buying it then? I mean, is it uh, a videographer who wants to set up several stands around an area or is it someone who's just going to put it on their camera? And, I think and it's I, I think it's a little bit of both because you know you have the Bluetooth built into it you have the app control and the nice thing about that is you can control and push the same settings to multiple lights simultaneously. So let's say you're doing an event and you have multiple shooters out there, you can come in, bring all your camera gear in, and say, okay, everybody's set to this white balance, and then you can say, all right, everybody's setting to the same white color temperature. So you know that you're producing, you're shooting the same thing at the same settings, and now you're producing the exact same light. So you have full consistency across it. And when it comes to consistency, one of the ways that we, we're really proud of the technology in here, and we are not afraid to show how accurate we are when it comes to our panels, each cello is actually going to come with a photometric calibration sheet. Mm. Now, what that means is within each unit, they're going to have this sheet that's going to tell you per serialized panel what the TLCI and CR CRI measurements are, and those are going to be listed from three to 10,000 Kelvin. And you'll see that we maintain a 97 plus TLCI from three to 10,000 Kelvin. You're also going to get your Lux rating depending on the uh, depending on the Kelvin settings. So you're going to see that we also deliver 1,200 Lux from 3 to 10,000 Kelvin. You're also going to get your color gamut readings from the RGB panel. You're going to get your beam angle, and you're going to get a lot of information out there that basically says, "Look, we did it. We're not hiding anything from you." We're so not. each each indi each unit is individually calibrated, and you get it documented as to exactly where this unit stands. Absolutely. It does not really get more pro than that, because, especially if you're dealing with, with multiple cameras and lights and you have to have everything being in agreement about what the color of the color is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's better to do it, it's better to have it done in camera than in post. Tell me what other, within the line, what other sizes and what other products do you guys put out? Well, right now... And this is the cello. Yeah, this is so the cello. The this is uh, the the light that we've had up for about a year, which was our first light that we came out with is named the Viola. We're going to be releasing a one by one studio panel, which is going to be based off the same technology sometime this summer. And that's going to be called the timpani. Mm -hmm. So here's the theme. It's called the orchestra series. Gotcha. And the app, of, the app, of course, is called the conductor. <laughs> so you're going to have the whole the whole shtick right Something there. That's, that's, actually, that's wonderful. Uh, I like that. And uh, <laughs> more information can be found at, at luxlylight.com and, of course, BH Photo. And BH Photo. And that's L-U-X-L-I. Luxly. Yep, the Luxley Cello. And again, it is. You know, there's a lot of LEDs here at this show, and we've seen them like walk go through the store. This is different. This one stands out from the pack. Yeah, this it's pretty is cool. not. This isn't just like something that looks like it was designed by some engineering student, because and it works very well. This is a whole concept, and this is a whole we've, system. That really yeah, we've nice. been working. We've been working. I appreciate that. Um, we've been working with a uh, a team over in Norway um, for about two years, developing the technology. And then we've been working on, you know, making sure the accuracy there and doing all of the engineering and the app design all over in Norway. It's even manufactured in Norway. Which means it's fjord tough. It is fjord tough. Fjord tough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Casey, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks a lot, Casey. Are with Rudy Winston of Canon. Hey, long time no see. Oh, it's great to be back. We are coming towards that time of year when uh, new toys start coming to market now. You know, we have a first half introduction period and typically a second half introduction period, which is usually in the fall. We did have some interesting things in the first half, though. Uh, the EOS M50 yeah. mirrorless camera was introduced uh, and is, you know, brand new to the marketplace. And uh, that's an interesting, to me anyway, an interesting and noteworthy camera in the lineage of the Canon mirrorless line. Uh, it's interestingly, if you look at the, the specs and the features, that is an entry level camera. We're not targeting the M50 at the you know, serious right. enthusiast mm -hmm. or certainly the working pro necessarily. But if you look at the features on that camera, you can make the case that that is the best and most fully featured entry-level 
interchangeable lens camera Canon has ever made. Now, spec-wise, what's a sh give us a short spec list. What it's, is it? The camera can shoot 7.4 frames a second with continuous servo autofocus. Okay. Uh, which is a lot faster than a Rebel can, and yeah, that's a level that only a few years ago, professional, top-of-the-line digital SLRs and, were working at. And the sensor size is? It's an APS-C APS sensor. Yeah, yes. it's an APS-C sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in that regard the same as the other mirrorless cameras we've had in the EOS M series line up right. to this point. Um, but the camera can shoot you know, up to 10 frames a second if you lock the focus. It has the dual pixel CMOS autofocus, which mm -hmm. is very fast. Yeah, yeah. It's not only fast, they've got more focusing points, more control on the focusing system, and it covers with certain lenses an even wider area of the picture. There's a lot of things on that camera that actually make it a very compelling entry-level alternative to a traditional digital SLR. You know, again, I'm not saying it's the right product for, you know, the, the, the high-end, serious, dedicated SLR enthusiast. But I think for a lot of people, this is the first EOS M-series camera that really kind of checks pretty much all the boxes. Uh, so that was an important introduction for us. Um, another one, and I'll be talking about this later today in one of our uh, uh, workshops, is the Speedlight 470 EX AI, mm -hmm. uh, which introduced... Emphasis on the, on the AI. Right. right. Uh, right. The auto-intelligent bounce system is what that flash brings to the marketplace, the world's first flash that can actually either A, calculate its own bounce angle, or B, you can set what you think is the right bounce angle, and then if you switch from horizontal to vertical, just tap the shutter button twice and it'll automatically reposition itself to maintain that bounce angle. So even for the, the high-end experienced photographer, if you're in a situation where you want to do bounce with a single flash on the camera and you need to work quick, it gives you the ability to shoot horizontals and verticals without that time spent with the camera away from your eye having to you know, kind of reposition the bounce angle when you go to vertical or whatever. So that's an intriguing piece, and we think it's going to, you know, flash for any of the camera companies is an important part of our business. And this, you know, is an effort, I think, on the part of our engineers and product planners to kind of reinvigorate that product category uh, for Canon. You know, we've certainly done well with the, with the Speedlight 600 series, with the mm -hmm. radio mm -hmm. transmission, which we introduced. Uh, you know, many of our high-end users love those, and obviously that's going to continue to remain a mainstay in our flash lineup. Uh, but 470 EX AI was another important introduction uh, that'll be available uh, come May or June, I believe. It'll begin to ship to dealers. But, of course, the, the announcement of it was already made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. why, aren't flashes, why aren't flashes going to re rechargeable batteries, then? We get a lot of people asking that, and yeah. I don't have an honest answer. I mean, we've you know suggested there actually that, is one on the market now. I yeah, we, the I brand we talked we, about, we were it, but about it. One. It would seem to be a natural. Honestly, I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, we've talked about you know would it, wouldn't it be cool if you could you know use the for instance uh, the rechargeable LPE6 N battery pack that we have for like the 7Ds and the mm -hmm. 5Ds yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. They've been around for a long time now, so many of our high end photographers you know already have a stash of those. Absolutely. Um, and you would think that they would power a speed light pretty effectively. Um, but up to now, the engineers just have chosen to go with double A's. You know, it may be the, you know, the easy availability of double A's. You got the option of, obviously, rechargeable nickel metal hydride sure. double A's, which isn't quite as convenient as a single battery pack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it no, does. But you said it best. I mean, because you, you I already have a second camera battery in my pocket. And the flash is going to go first before the camera battery. Probably. You take that and you throw that in there and you're good to go and you rotate if you need to. And it doubles, it, double A's love in, to, in the ass. Yeah, we'd love to see it. Uh, yeah. The engineers have never given a specific answer as to why up to this point they haven't. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly it's still not something that we're seeing a lot of in the industry. I wouldn't be, uh, and I'm not winking at you as I say this or anything. Right. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if within a couple, three years, yeah. we start seeing just industry-wide more of that. Yeah. Uh, as, you know, as battery technology continues to get better and better. Yeah. What else is new? Well, one other one that isn't brand, brand new, but it is still kind of new in the line that people have heard about, no doubt, if they're into, you know, the, the, the craft of digital SLRs. The 85mm 1.4 lens with the image stabilization. That came out last year, 2017. Yeah. A marvelous, marvelous addition. And a lens that we actually did a presentation on the 85 millimeter series of lenses that Canon has earlier today because this is a program that deals, that concentrates on the wedding, portrait, and event photographer uh, type application. But that 85 1.4 is 
it's the sharpest 85 millimeter lens we make. Mm -hmm. all, the others are all good, but this is, if you're really picking nits, this is the highest performance one, even wide open. Uh, the image stabilization changes the whole dynamic of working with that type of lens in low light. Uh, with that four-stop correction, you know, I made the point in the presentation that if the average, and, and it's not that four-stop correction with image stabilization is, you know, unheard of in the industry. Obviously, many lenses now from different companies have optical image stabilization or some form of stabilization. But the beauty of that in real-world terms mm -hmm. is if you, if the average photographer could say that, hey, in low light, the slowest speed I could normally safely handle an 85 millimeter lens was, let's say, a 60th of a second. Four stops of stabilization means you can handhold that lens with a stationary subject, of course, at a quarter of a second, which is, I mean, it, and again, I'm not saying this is, you know, unique in the industry or whatever, but what is unique is this is right now the only interchangeable lens, 85 millimeter with an F1.4 aperture and image stabilization built in right now. Uh, that combination and the optical power of that lens, the sharpness of it, uh, it is, it, it, if you're thinking, something to go beyond one of the f2.8 professional zoom lenses if you're a working photographer with maybe a 24 to 70 and or a 70 to 200 2.8 and you're looking for a way to go beyond what those have not to get rid of them but to join your system any of the 85s are a great fit and that new 8514 is just sweet okay uh rudy winston always great chatting with you we look forward to having you back again. It's, the pleasure is always mine. Delighted to be here at the Depth of Field event. Delighted to work with the team at b &H. It's an opportunity, and I thank you folks for granting it to me. Our pleasure. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you. We are with Greg Lee, who's a senior product trainer, one of the senior product trainers with LG Electronics, and he's joining us here today. Uh, LG's got a bunch of monitors right across the way here. You know, it's an interesting thing. Photography has become pretty much all digital, and even people who are shooting film quite often are taking their stuff and scanning it, and ultimately it's digital output. And where are we looking at our pictures ultimately? On a monitor. And for most people, that means their phone or their tablet. Um, and if they're working at home or in office, they do have a monitor, but monitors aren't all the same. No. And they, not no. at all. <laughs> at all. And, and, and no, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I, I know people that, you know, they spend tons of money on cameras, okay? And they're looking at their pictures on a monitor that you buy, like, by the pound. You know, it's a great deal. You know, right. And the numbers sounded, you know. But there's a big difference. So what separates your LG from the pack? What are some of your features that you have? Well, what are things that people should be looking for? Photographers. The, for photographers, yeah. exactly. Well, we just feel you should look at LG and yeah. then <laughs> everything just falls to the wayside. <laughs> so no, it, it, those are excellent questions because, you know, I also shoot photography and it, there's really a major issue for me sometimes when I'm shooting bringing it into a monitor, I do my editing, and everything looks fine and dandy, and then I go to print it, and it's like, well, this does not match up. So what LG does is we have you know monitors that basically adhere to the same color standards that you're typically using in cameras. Mm -hmm. So sRGB is what a lot of people typically shoot with. We have monitor here, you know, monitors here that will cover that range. They come from the factory color calibrated, and you even have the ability over the life of the monitor to go in and do hardware calibration. So as the monitor ages, you can make sure that what's coming out of your camera and what you're seeing on the screen are a perfect match. Uh, now the printing side of things, there's a whole other calibration sure, there that's yeah, outside of the sure, range, sure, sure. but it's well, what happens to a monitor as it ages. I mean, uh, I mean, what what are the things you're going to see as a monitor ages that would take away from? And how soon do you start noticing these changes? Well, it, it typically happens so slowly that you don't really see it, but it exists, and a lot of, a lot of it is brightness. You know, things come out of the box searing bright, and they slowly get dimmer over time. It's like a tungsten bulb. I mean, they look great, Similar. but if you compare a new and an old bulb, the, the old one's dimmer and warmer. Exactly. So it's nice to be able to go into the monitor, have a calibration package, and say, okay, red still looks like red, but green seems to be a little bit more yellowish, so I can now compensate you know, in the way that I'm driving the panel to make sure that everything stays consistent. So it makes sure that your workflow stays accurate is, you know, over the life of the product, and uh, it really makes actually speeds things up. So when you go to print and you're working on a calibrated printer system, everything matches up. Uh, 
So that's one of the things that we like to do, make sure that the colors are there. Another thing is, is that if you work collaboratively, you know, if you're yeah. working within uh, you know, advertising group and everybody's looking over your shoulder and you're looking at the same screen, but from different angles, we don't realize that a lot of the LCD panels and these LED monitors are not great off axis. You have yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, yeah. twisted pneumatics. You mm -hmm. have uh, uh, vertical aligned crystals, and we use in plane switching. Not that you know the difference, but the key thing is with in plane switching. If you're dead on center, which is where most people edit from, it looks fine on everything. But if I'm reviewing something with a mm -hmm. you know a counterpart and they're to my right, and you know our director of advertising is to the left they may be seeing totally different shades of green or colors of red on the same monitor just because of where they're viewing it. So we all agree that the color's right. When it prints, I'm happy, and the two of them are like, wait a second, that is a much deeper red, or that's a much more right. solid green than the seafoam green we thought we were looking at. So you want a monitor that you know adheres to the standards, which we work really closely to do. Second thing is that you know if you work collaborative, you want a monitor that looks great to everybody and it's also accurate. So IPS is a uh, technology that LG has been deploying not only in our computer monitors but also our televisions at home, which allows you a wider viewing angle with the consistency of performance and color as well. So uh, it's a technology we've hung our hat on and a lot of you know graphic professionals out there, photographic professionals have also picked up on the fact that this IPS panel technology provides a more consistent color rendition regardless of where they are when they're editing. Because sometimes I've got an older monitor that I use just for review, but if I move up or down, I can make the contrast better or worse <laughs> just yeah, by simply moving it. my yeah. head three yeah, inches. Sure. So as we're looking you know, at the monitors across the show floor here, even off axis, I mean, the brilliance of the fireworks that are on the screen right now are bright, they're solid, they're dramatic, and if I walked right in front of it, they would look exactly the same. How often should a monitor be calibrated? Because I think for a lot of people, it's like changing the oil in the car. They know it's time to change when the car don't start, um, or the job is returned by the client. So how often should this be done? It doesn't hurt to do it you know, more often. Uh, there are calibration packages out there that you can get and self-do this and get very close results and very consistent results. Mm -hmm. Doesn't hurt to do it, you know, once a year, twice a year would be better. You know, every quarter, probably even more consistent. And if you're working where accuracy is real important, you know, quarterly would probably be a good solid number. And uh, what model would you recommend? What's that was the my next question. Latest, yeah. greatest for a photographer, let's say. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing photography, um, several options. And uh, I would say that uh, one that we've been pointing out today is our 34-inch uh, UM88. It's a reasonably priced. It's a 34 ultra wide, which normally we're used to seeing a four by three, 16 by nine aspect ratio, 16 10 maybe. This is 21 by nine. That's the second unit there. Yeah, it's the okay. second unit. One mm -hmm. to the second from the left. Uh, I'm sorry, second for the right. Right. And the yeah, first the 21 on the left. by nine ultra wide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if I learned gives you directions, we'd be better <laughs> off. The uh, but the 21 by nine. The thing I like about it is, if you go to a really large monitor on your desk, you end up having to lift your head up and down and yeah. you're nodding. You know, well, yeah. here it's more or less just a tennis match. You're moving left and right. Yeah. We have two eyes. They're horizontally you know, opposed to one in each other. So having the extra space is great. I can put three documents of information on there or I could have a full 16 by nine image and still have a control panel to do editing That's for cool. photo or video or whatnot on the same screen. sRGB, uh, so with the color space we're using for photography, typically uh, Type-C USB connections, uh, and it's you know color calibrated out of the box, so put it on your desk, even if you don't calibrate it with you know hardware, software, should be a good match to start and get you going. We were talking about earlier on where if you're standing a little few degrees off left or right, you're seeing a different image, a different color, contrast, whatever. Does the curve screen correct that if you're seated, seated there centrally, you turn your head left and right, is it an even field as far as what your, your eye is receiving? It depends on the set, actually. Okay. But if you're, it, it would help a little if a monitor did not do well off axis in terms of color saturation by keeping the plane of the monitor more flat okay. to you, but it'd only be applicable more or less to one person. If you had two or three people you know, in a collaborative environment, because they were off axis, it may even exacerbate the problem. So what would the advantage be then of a curved 
screen. It looks cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, you know, it's funny. It's it's kind of a personal preference. There there are arguments being made that it cuts down on the reflectivity in the environment. We should keep the lights down low anyway. Yeah. Uh, second thing is it it's supposed to keep the unit from the seated position, like you said, more or less in parallel. And it does give the perception of more depth in the image. I would imagine a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of teases and fools your brain to thinking, oh, this image looks a little bit more you know, immersive. But you know, in photography, we shoot on a flat sensor, we shoot on flat film, we print typically on flat medium, and we're going to edit on a curved device. You know, it really comes down to personal preference. Some people like the look of the curve just because it's unique and different. There's not necessarily a performance disadvantage to it, but there's not really that much of a performance advantage either. So whatever you're happy with, we have a solution, flat oh. or slightly curved. Did, it, did LG ever consider coming out with a, uh, a screen that, with a, like a shattered screen so that the picture will look like what it looks like on the person's phone? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you, you can probably get an overlay that you know, simulates that that you stick on there. If not, you and I have got a new business opportunity we need to discuss. We'll talk. Okay. So, the yeah. broken iPhone uh, review <laughs> monitor. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Greg Lee from LG, thank you so much for stopping by. Great talking with you. Thanks for hanging out. This is too much fun. Let's do it again sometime. You got it. We are now joined by Pano Kalagaropoulos. Anyway, Pano K is with us here. <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> and Pano is actually, he's the uh, photographer in chief. He's also the head muckety muck at Tog Tees. If you listen to our podcast a few months back, I did a whole thing on Tog Tees, which are really cool t-shirts and caps and sweatshirts and hoodies that we started carrying at B&H. And they're real fun and they're all photographic and um, little things like uh, uh, ISO 800 or 35 millimeter or all kinds of things. My, one of my favorites is the old time, it looks like Nathan's hot dogs thing, is photography since 1827. <laughs> and that funky old deluxe lettering. And they come in great colors. There's a sunny 16 hat and a lot of things that if you're into photography, you get it, you smile. And they're very, the colors are good. And the design and is And the good. designs yeah. are wonderful and yeah. they make you smile and giggle. And uh, tell us about it. Where did all this come from? Wh whose brainchild was this? Sure, absolutely. So I've been a photographer for about 20 years. Uh, started off shooting film for the first 10 years, then digital for the next 10, and started going back to film recently. Uh, and basically a couple years ago just had the idea that there isn't really a line of nice, high-quality uh, shirts for people who are really into photography. There's a lot of really bad stuff out there. <laughs> there um, is, yes. <laughs> a lot of marketing t-shirts floating around there. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot swag. of stuff That's you right. don't really want to wear, um, but we want to make something really nice, um, something that people would be uh, you know, excited to put on and go outside. And it's not cheesy. It doesn't just no, say, it's fun. It's I'm fun. a photographer or something. You know, it's, it's something kind of a little more neutral, a little more mild. You can wear it out. It's stylish. It's cool. It tells people that you're into photography photography without shouting it at you. Uh, so yeah, no, And there's no brand names. No brand names, that's yeah, right. Yeah, which means you can switch to Sony without having to... <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just got together with a friend of mine who's a graphic designer, uh, and I'm the photographer, he's the graphic designer. We work together really closely to come up with original, unique designs. Uh, we launched it a couple years ago, and what we've done since then is we've partnered with a couple of uh, big local photographers in Philadelphia where we're based to come out with their own unique, original designs, and that's worked really well um, for them and for us. They get to get their own unique design that they didn't have before, and we get to kind of come up with new ideas. Uh, for and that's example. a marketing t-shirt for them? No, or, so uh, or, I'll give you an example, yeah. like the audiovisual design, which is one of our popular enamel yeah, pins I love that and t-shirt. Yeah, we came up with this with a, a guy named Darren Burton, who's an Instagram uh, photographer, big uh, name in Philly, and uh, he's he had this hashtag about how he posts a picture and then a song to go with it, so it was audiovisual diary. So we thought of a way to combine both cameras and music, you know, audio and visual, and so we sat down hashed it out for a few hours and came up with this idea of an SLR camera with a vinyl record player as the lens. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. And so now they're, you know, people are buying this all over the world, even though it's kind of like a Philly specific photographer that we came up with the idea. It doesn't really matter because right. it's a general appeal. And it's a cool design. People like it. It talks about 
a kind of a you know, hearkening back to the more analog, the analog age, yeah, right? Sure. Oh yeah, the camera itself looks actually looks like an instamatic, really. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's got that, and then it's uh, it's undeniable that you look at the lens and you realize it's a turntable, and there's you know the arm and the needle on it, and it's a, it's a fun logo, and the and the colors are good, and the quality looks great. In fact, you're wearing one of your t-shirts and one of your caps right now. That's uh, right. And and they're great stuff. Uh, it's fun, you know. It, it, Photography is a fun thing, and this is just a fun extension of it. It gives you a chance to have a giggle and, you know, ha- have a cap or a shirt or a sweater that just shows what you do. And Which ones what you uh, love tend it. to sell the best? Yeah, what is the best? Uh, so surprisingly, the uh, since we launched a couple of years ago, the ISO 800 has been the number really? one bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what's funny is when we first launched it, everyone would, you know, write on the comments on Facebook and whatever, why 800? I like, you know... 400 or I would have gone 400 myself. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think I'd gone 50. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think the answer, you know, originally was uh, I'm a low light shooter myself. I d- I've done a lot of night photography, and so I prefer uh, higher ISOs, particularly in film. Um, uh, photography, but I, then the other answer is, you know, 800 kind of makes a statement in a way that 400 doesn't, right? And also in a way that 100 doesn't. I mean, 100 says that you shoot in broad daylight. Okay, that's fine, but like, that's not as interesting as 800, right? And so I think it worked really well as a sort of create conversation and then spark, uh, you know, arguments about why we chose that, but uh, it, it's been the, by far the number one best-selling design, uh, which is kind of wild. <laughs> That's great. And That's you, great. you market, distribute, it's all, you're doing it all, you're getting them out there to be yeah, going? Yeah, me and my friend, we, we do the, um, the, the, come up with the designs, we use a couple local high-quality uh, printers to print stuff, and we use local guys so that we can make sure it's up to, you know, the quality that we want. Mm-hmm. We are actually there all the time, making sure they're printing stuff right. Because uh, it seems easy, you know, just like a uh, maybe a one color design or two color design and uh, but there's a lot of ways to screw it up yeah. and there's a lot of ways to print it so that it it doesn't last a long time or it doesn't look right and so we want to make sure that everything we send out is really high quality that was always the focus from the beginning you know these are these are not super expensive shirts but they're definitely not cheap shirts um, and the feel is um, the material is really soft but it's also durable it's not going to stretch it doesn't thread uh, so we focused a lot on just maintaining the high, really high quality, and so that's why we actually do the design, we monitor the printing, and we do the fulfillment ourselves uh, to make sure that it's you know the way we want it to look. Can you give us an example of, or a few examples of uh, some of the designs and some of the uh, images? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, just one fun fact, if you go on our website or our Instagram, you know, all the product images you're seeing, we've shot ourselves. Um, mm-hmm. oh, so good. we design the, pr- the products, we find local photographers that we're friends with or that we know we work with to model them for us, and then we take the pictures ourselves. So, you know, our number one is the ISO 800. Uh, another top one is the photography since 1827. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was obviously an idea we came up with of that co- sort of baseball retro script. Uh, yes. Some other designs that we have that are popular is our 1980s T. It was, it's based on a Contax T2, um, but we, the, yes. the vibe that we ended up coming up with, and it comes in kind of uh, uh, bright green and and a, and a bright blue. So we kind of made it the 1980s T because it was a little more uh, neon e than, than our, the rest of our designs. Uh, we got the 35 millimeter, which is actually our best-selling hat. We have uh, is that okay? Yeah, if you look up a hashtag 35 millimeter hat on Instagram, you'll see a, a ton of them. People get them all over the world. There's a bunch of different colors, and uh, people love them. Uh, we also have some mugs as well. Uh, but there's we've we've launched over 35 designs in the past uh, two years. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Some of them are a little more esoteric. Like, you know, I'm wearing right now the Sunny 16 hat. It just says 16 with a little sun over the eye. So. And you got to be a photographer to get yeah, that, exactly. especially an analog photographer. Yeah, so you won't really know that unless you kind of know uh, what, uh, you know your photographic history a little bit. Um, and then there's other ones, like we have an F8 and Be There shirt. Yes. <laughs> um, you know. So, website again and Instagram, where do we find it? Where do people find you? Sure, so it's uh, www.togtees.com That's T-O-G-T-E-E-S um, and our Instagram is at TogTees. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Uh, and you can always shoot us a message on Instagram or, or email us at hello at TogTees. We always respond. Okay. People send us ideas and stuff oh, cool. from all over the world. Custom so make? Do you custom make stuff? Uh, yeah. We do if it's the right Wait quantity. Um, we can't do one offs. Of um, but if you've got like a photo club, we've done work for photo clubs or other organizations that want to make do a run of, say, 30, 50 shirts, we'll sure. do that. And also, just about everything is on our website. Some of the newer items, there are no photographs there yet. Yep. But yep. that will be catching we're, up. We're working on that. I love this stuff. It's a lot of fun. It's up. 
it's a giggle, and a nice cap and a nice T-shirt It's always a good thing to have. Absolutely. Okay. Good presence. All right. Pano, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. All right. We are back at Depth of Field, and um, we are with Steph- Stefan, or Steven, take your choice, Gomez, and he's with... Um, Go Docs. Go Docs. Yep. And one of the principal uh, sponsors of the uh, event. That's We might add that, too. Go Docs is one of the sponsors of this lovely event we have here. So... Godox is getting a lot of press around here and a lot of good words and things. Everyone seems to be talking up about it. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that they are one of the only companies that comes out of uh, China that's actually able to produce products that keep up with uh, the major brands like Profoto and Braun Color. Um, their flagship light right now is the AD600 Pro, which is a 600-watt monolight, battery-powered, that has a recycle time of uh, full power at less than a second. So it's you're able to fire very quickly at full power and keep color consistency among all those shots. And how many watt seconds is it? Uh, 600. 600. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Their other big seller is the AD200, which is their pocket strobe. It's literally the size of maybe a small brick. And uh, it's 200 watt seconds. And what's really cool about it is that it has removable heads. So you get a bare bulb head, very similar to like a, a quantum head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can put a speed light head on it. So you could use all your mag mod accessories or your other speed light accessories. Or you can take it off altogether. You get the adapter that they make called an ADDB2 and combine two AD200s together and you end up with a 400 watt second strobe. Ooh. Yeah. It's uh, maybe the most versatile light on the market right now. You guys have a whole line of lights over there. I mean, everything from from small flashes mm-hmm. to these big strobes, right? Yeah, we've yeah. brought over. Well, uh, at the booth we have the all the mono lights. So we have the eighty six hundred Pro. Mm-hmm. We have the older version, which is the eighty six hundred BM, which was the original version. Uh, with the eighty six hundred BM, we also have the extension head. So you actually could turn the head itself into a pack, and then just boom out a two pound head that has a Bowen's mount on it. So you can have a very lightweight package booming over a subject. Because the heads themselves can be on the heavier side. The 8600 Pro is about 7.5 pounds, and the original is about 6.5. And then we have the AC-powered strobes that vary in wattage from uh, 400 watts to 600 watts. And there's also uh, also a 600-watt AC strobe that also recycles in about one second and has a flash duration of about 1 20,000th of a second. Uh, Yeah. And over at our booth, uh, at our main info booth, we have all the speed lights, um, the lithium rechargeable uh, speed lights, which is another big thing for for Godox. That's what we were talking, talking about. about. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. That, that I mean, that's the reason why I started chewing Godox to begin with was because yeah. I sh- I shot a lot of weddings and I hate AA batteries right. with a passion. And I found that these, uh, I mean, shooting at full power, they say they're ready for about 300 flashes, but really you're pushing a lot more than that. And if you're shooting less than full power, uh, I've shot an entire wedding on one speed light with one bat- one lithium battery, maybe three and a half thousand shots. And I, I never had to replace the battery. Now, somebody also mentioned uh, one of our other guests earlier today was talking about this unit. And they mentioned that in high speed sync mode, it's actually putting out more light than mm-hmm. some of the big boys across the aisle. Yep. Absolutely. Um, the 8200 or the 8600? I don't recall. Do you? What, no. The 8600 uh, in high speed sync, you're going to lose about one stop of, of full power. Um, if you're compared to other brands where you see up to two stops of light loss. That's what we were told. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a lot. It's big time. If you're shooting, if you're a photographer that shoots on location outdoors, uh, you're doing a lot of like the urban street portraiture, and you're using high-speed sync, uh, having that extra power to fight the sun in the middle of the day is, is, a, is a big advantage. Yep, mm. yep, yep. No, that's 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 pretty tremendous. It's well, big stuff. you know, one of the other comments we got earlier, and it, I don't know it was off the record, but it's, it's not anymore, is that... Godox is uh, scaring some mm-hmm. of the bigger companies, yeah. uh, and they're putting out a really good product at a more affordable price. So, how, how long has Godox been around? Well, uh, just for clarity, I don't yeah. work for Godox. Yeah. Uh, I'm just I rep- representing them here. Yeah, I, I, work, I work for B and H. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they, I've, I've done a lot of studying on the company because they're so cool. Mm-hmm. I find them so interesting. They've been around since '93. Okay. Uh, they've been OEMing for a lot of other companies for a long time. Right. So a lot of third-party flashes you see on Amazon or other places. Other markets uh, are most likely made by them. They have like four really big facilities in China where they produce uh, these products. They have a really big uh, uh, R&D staff of about 15 people, if I remember from from reading mm-hmm. uh, their bio not too long ago. Um, you know, they'll do a lot of their own research and development. They're not, you know, a lot of they, a lot of these brands get flack for 
for copying other right. brands. But they're actually, you know, they're doing the research and putting out a, a unique product like the AD200, which you don't see very often. And um, I believe, if I'm not wrong, I'm not 100% sure on this, but uh, if memory serves right, they were the first company to produce a speed light that was powered by a lithium ion battery. They, that uh, is correct. Yeah, That's, they were the first ones. Yeah, that and was a big push. If you're familiar with speed lights, they all have the same interface. Yeah. You can go from Canon to Nikon to Panasonic to Godox to whoever, and you kind of, if you're familiar with speed lights, you, you get it. And so the bigger strobes that you're talking about, that's a new product? Yeah. Uh, that's a new mm -hmm. line of products? So uh, there, there's a, there was the 8600, which made really big waves, I think about two years ago when it first okay. came out. Uh, 600 watt monolite, battery powered. You got 500 flashes at full power. Uh, and then they had all these different accessories that went with the light. So um, you had, it was a Bones mounted light, so you had access to tons of modifiers, right? All you just need is the right speed ring. Um, the battery high capacity, and what they came out with too is a, a AC pack. So you took the battery off, put on the AC pack, and now you're able to plug right into the wall and uh, you had a full-on AC uh, strobe for your off, mm -hmm. for your uh, studio. studio. Yeah. Um, this That light got a lot of press. A lot of uh, photographers really liked it. A lot of the younger generation photographers really liked it because it was light, portable, easy to use outdoors. So they came out with this new version, the 8600 Pro, and it's it's probably my favorite light. I mean, I've used lighting equipment from almost every brand and I've switched over almost entirely to Godox. Mm. Uh, the 8600 Pro's recycle time at full power is less than a second. So if you're somebody like me who likes to work with one light, uh, one big light, like a four foot octa or a five foot octa, you can just shoot and shoot and shoot. And they say you're supposed to get 360 flashes at full power. Um, but if you're shooting less than full power, then you're getting thousands of shots before you ever have to change out the battery. And the price point is really what sells a lot of people on it because you're getting a lot of high-end features that you would see from their competitors for a very low price point, maybe less than half of what you'd pay. The a question about that, just to go back to the lithium-ion battery in this, mm -hmm. is that a battery that can come out, or do you have to mm -hmm. charge? Oh, okay. You can put. They're all removable. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so, so you can't flip a battery and keep yep, working. Yep, absolutely. And what's the recharge time on it? Uh, if you have a completely dead battery, yeah. you're looking at about two hours to recharge it to full. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you're recharging it from half, which is what I normally do, you're looking at about 45 minutes. And you, guys sell, you sell batteries separately too, because mm -hmm. you're going to need more and more. Yep. Right? Yeah, batteries are sold separately for the speed lights, the AD200 pocket strobe, and the AD600, both versions. Wow. Yeah. Great. You guys going to look into uh, uh, LEDs at all? Because everybody's doing LEDs, and right. you're a flash company. Right. Are you guys exploring that possibility? Well, Godox does produce LEDs as well. They ah. produce LED panels. Uh, they do uh, chip on board LEDs. Um, they, they're in that whole constant light as well. Steve Gomez, thank you so much. No problem, thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. And we are joined by John Kreidler. And he's with Leica, and you are the product specialist, East Coast Correct. Pro Professional product, products. Professional products, right. which includes which cameras now? The S and the SL. Okay, not oh. the M's. You don't consider the M's? That's M's are used by professionals, but they're currently not under that. So what, what are they classified as? A great camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Uh, Leica is an interesting company. Uh, I mean, everybody knows it was, uh, you know, the 35 millimeter cameras all evolved from that based on motion picture film back in the 20s. Um, and then the camera just kept developing. And in 1954, the first M came out, the M3. Correct. Correct. And that became sort of a standard for the industry and remained so for the longest time. Um, and even though, uh, it, you might actually say that it was the first, the first mirrorless cameras. <laughs> actually, exactly. Leica. Uh, they didn't have mirrors in them. They were rangefinders. What I find particularly amazing about Leica, and, and again, if you haven't, heard, if the name is not familiar to you, you've got a lot of research to do. What I find amazing is that the M3 came out in 1954, and if you look at all of the current M cameras, correct, film and digital, and you make them both. All right, right. They are all, almost dead ringers for the original camera. The concept. The whole philosophy, the design, never changed. And here we are, what, uh, um, almost 60-something years later? Correct. And you can now take almost all of the original lenses and use them on the newest bodies and vice versa. Correct. There's, there, I believe there's only three. Is it 21 millimeter? That 21 super angular, yeah. a couple of those uh, that have, basically it's the rear lens flange would go too far into the body. Right. So it would work once. 
and then the sensor is destroyed. Yeah. So <laughs> well, not, it's a one shot pony. It's a one shot deal. but totally worth it. Yeah, but the picture quality is awesome. It that is one incredible. picture that you get, um, <laughs> unbelievable. Some might say. <laughs> uh, I don't know of any other ca- camera company that could actually carry that kind of philosophy for so long and have it still work. And, and I think it's also amazing that not very long ago, in the grand scheme of things, Leica was really on the brink of maybe not even existing for a while. Correct. And now. Not only is the M become uh, uh, is, is still a mainstream camera, but you have these new cameras out. You have the S cameras, which are phenomenal. Um, I used them when they first came out, and I was totally blown away by what you guys actually do. So you have 35, you have medium format. The image quality is beautiful, and you're not necessarily uh, cutting edge per se, but boy, do you put out a solid, good product that holds up forever. Right. I, what, I guess what I would say is we've... Um, maintain true to the DNA of the company. Yeah. Uh, so our cameras, the M camera, you think, you hear the word Leica, what do you think? You think of a rangefinder. Sure. Uh, but what we do, our, I think our core, I guess what we do best is lenses. And when we look at a medium format camera that's 37 and a half megapixel and even a mirrorless camera that's 24 megapixel, the lenses are designed to out-resolve the sensor. So just like you could use on our SL legacy glass from R&M, and those lenses look incredible. They have a different personality than today's lenses. Yes. But the, the big thing is what I call the Lego look, the creamy, what I would describe as a creamy sharpness. So it's the focus plane is crisp and sharp, and the fall off to foreground and background is very natural and makes the image look three dimensional. And that's what our customers connect with. That's one. The second thing is just the user interface how you put the camera in your hand, and people just say, ah, oh, this is like a breath of fresh air. This is simple. I don't have to go down four levels in a menu to change my ISO. That is so critical. So, right, um, so it's user yeah. interface. Um, so, and it, it's a lot of the, the products are hand assembled in Germany. So there's that human element to what we do. And I think, you know, it kind of sounds corny, but the reality is people connect with that. And it just allows them as a photographer to get beyond the technical part of the camera and photograph. It's one thing to go out taking pictures. It's another thing to go out taking pictures with a camera that I love working with this camera. (laughs) I like this camera. You you mentioned something that to me is very special about Leica. All myth and legend aside, uh, it's easy to get lost in that, but when the M8 came out, the first digital Mm -hmm. M, one of the things that struck me about it was how simple the menus were and how logical, and there was no garbage, there was no junk. Everything just felt where it should be. I don't even think I cracked the manual open and it was all there. And then when you came out with the S, I used that. I looked at that menu and go, it's still here. This mm-hmm. is this is the a like a philosophy brought down to the menus. Right. And it was kind of funny. I just <laughs> I picked up a uh, made in 2002 the Digilux one I found on okay. eBay right. in mint shape, new in a box, and I've been using it. four megapixel killer. Right. It makes awesome five by sevens. Um, it's a, it's I, the lens. It's the, <laughs> it's the lens that does it. Yeah. But what gets me is that even here in this basic point and shoot, you had the simplicity menus in there. Mm-hmm. It wasn't quite as refined back then, this 14 years ago, 16 right. years ago. But you had it down there, and I'm looking at the new cameras, and I, 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 you know, I own other brand cameras, and I've used just about everything out there right, right. now. And most of them are just so over-designed and overloaded. and I pick up a Leica, and son of a gun, they did their menus exactly the way they designed their cameras. Right. And it works. And that's another part of our philosophy is just the essentials, Keep it simple. Mm-hmm. and that's what we're about. Could you give us any ideas of some things that might be coming down the pike from Leica? Well, the thing to us, uh, we're continuing to, to develop our SL lens system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have uh, just announced this week, and we have a sample here of the 16 to 35. Okay. Uh, that's an incredible lens, focuses as close as 10 and a half inches. I like that. Uh, beautiful. So if, if you're someone that likes really wide but likes foreground point of interest to be in focus, you can certainly do that with, uh, with that lens. So in the fall, then, we have a, a 35 APO Summicron, 
mm-hmm. which I believe it's the first time that we'll have an APO. It's 35 millimeter uh-huh. and also a 50 APO Sumicron. That's joining the 75 and the 90, both APO uh, Sumicrons. So uh, for us, that then three zooms, 1635, 2490, 90 to 280, then primes 75, 90, 35, and 50. That's a real system, plus the ability to use all the legacy M glass, pretty yeah. much. Legacy R glass, you can use S lenses. Uh, so then the, uh, the CL is our APS-C camera that is a system camera, but also uses the same lenses as the SL. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all those lenses would mount, and a lot of people are using those when they're doing 4K video on the SL, because they're smaller and lighter. You put it in a gimbal, you've got, you're not losing anything. Uh, right. Because it's cropped, we record Cine 4K and UHD at um, Super 35. So uh, all that's pretty pretty exciting for us in, in terms of the completion of that system. Uh, this being a photo kina year, I imagine that we'll hear more about that lens system. By the way, Leica has, has been doing this for a while, um, many years, decades ago. Uh, Leica was, I believe, the first consumer company to start introducing um, a spheric lens, a spheric elements. Correct. Okay, and the reason why is because Leica engineers said, figured out that film technology, the quality of film is getting to a point where the films are actually almost as sharp Correct. as our, so therefore we have to up the game. Correct. And that's what most manufacturers are dealing, first dealing with today, right. with these higher resolution sensors. They didn't have to deal with it film because the lenses were good enough. Right, exactly. But now they can't do it. Right. Hmm. So yeah, that's something to take in mind when you are buying a new system. You make right. sure your glass is as good as the camera you have. Exactly. So, hmm. all right, John, thank you so much oh, for bringing you. us up to speed on the us. latest from Leica. Appreciate it. Okay. Take care. This has been a long, exhausting day here. We've spoken to, I don't know how many vendors and, and learned about so much stuff. My head is kind of spinning here right now. Uh, we hope that you at home or in your car or in the train or wherever you're listening to this podcast uh, also enjoyed it. We had a blast doing this. And uh, stay tuned for future episodes. And in the meantime, on behalf of John, Jason, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today. 